All right. So thanks everybody for for joining us this evening, Chris and Andrew. Thank you for setting this up. This is uh, this is awesome. And Dr. Gentile, obviously, thank you so much for your time and effort putting this together this evening. Um, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Jim Edson, our VP of Downstream Marketing. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Michael Gentile of Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia, who's going to be presenting tonight on a topic that's near and dear to his heart, which is trauma of the midfoot. Uh, Dr. Gentile's put together a presentation that's going to detail his treatment algorithm for for midfoot uh, pathologies, including Liz Frank. He's going to talk a bit about hardware and soft tissue considerations, and then he's put together a bank of cases. Uh, just a little bit about Dr. Gentile, for those of you who don't know, he completed medical school at the California College of Podiatric Medicine in Oakland, uh, and then completed his surgical residency at Presbyterian St. Uh, Luke's here in Denver, where Paragon 28 is located. Uh, Dr. Gentile is a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons and is certified by the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery in Foot and Ankle Reconstructive Surgery. So, uh, Dr. Gentile, thank you as always for putting this together. And for the folks that are that are there this evening, this is meant to be an open forum, open dialogue. So if you have questions, please, you know, uh, just just come off mute, raise your hand or just shout them out and Dr. Gentile will take care of them. That sounds great. great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. I appreciate it. Of course. Jim, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as Jim mentioned, for just another short five weeks, uh, I'm an assistant professor and the chief of foot and ankle surgery in the Department of Orthopedics at Marshall School of Medicine in West Virginia. And as most of you probably know, as Dr. Uh, Jessica Potter's one of your attendings, I'll be coming out to your neck of the woods. And I think you'll have the chance to work with me at least in your second and third years. And I'm always excited to talk about trauma. It's one of the things that I love. It's one of the things get I get to do a lot of, and I'm very blessed about that. So without further ado, we're going to hop right into it. So as any talk, we should always kind of state what our goals are right up front. And as Jim mentioned, one of the things I want to be able to talk about is kind of my treatment rationale. And it's not that I do anything special per se. It's really basing, following basic principles. But of course, I'll put my own little flavor to it as well. There's a diversity of implant options available. When I was a resident, about the only option we had was basically small frag and mini frag sets. I think the foot modular set came out of my last year of residency. And we thought we were really fancy if we were using the hand modular set. And to look at where we are now with a lot of companies trying to get into the foot and ankle space, I really don't think that anyone's done it uh, better or more comprehensively or thoughtfully than Paragon 28. The other thing that I was asked to talk about is the role of biologics specific to this topic. And then last, as Jim said, we'll go over cases and I can explore the tips, quips, and pearls I can impart upon you. So as we all know, in dealing with orthopedic trauma, it doesn't matter where in the musculoskeletal system we're dealing with this, they're going to be the same principles that we're required to follow. And the one thing that we always stress to our residents is to understand the mechanism of injury. The mechanism of injury is so important. It's going to inform your understanding of the soft tissue envelope. It's going to help you understand the osseous injury, the non-osseous injuries that are part of the musculoskeletal system, and also how this trauma could affect the patient and their outcomes. And the top three rules of orthopedic trauma are soft tissue, soft tissue, and soft tissue. So being able to manage that soft tissue envelope is essential, but you can't do that appropriately if you don't understand the mechanism of injury. And last is what is the injury attached to? The residents will always come over on Monday morning after their weekend call, excited to hand off a bunch of foot and ankle trauma to me. And the first question I always ask them is what is that fracture attached to? And we'll talk about that more as we get into this. So it's all about the soft tissue. This is a spectrum of soft tissue injuries that one can see here. We start off on the left, you can see very easily, this is a pretty straightforward, clean laceration. This is a high energy injury that happened after a dirt bike accident. And then the next one right to it, this was also a dirt bike accident. Both of these caused by the foot peg. Both of these patients had appropriate riding boots on as well. But you can see the difference in what we have to deal with with the picture on the left, versus the one right next to it. We have catastrophic injury, not only to the bottom of the foot that you can see, but this went across the dorsum of the foot as well. And this basically, the whole entire forefoot opened up like a shark's mouth on this second picture. And what you can see is the bloody clot in this picture here is actually the comminuted first metatarsal. As opposed to crush injuries, where the injury may not be manifest right away. It's going to take some time for it to show itself. And you can see you're starting to get fairly significant hemorrhagic changes, showing that you're probably going to lose the bulk of this in a late degloving injury. 
And then, of course, there's catastrophic high ballistic injuries that can occur on this far right with a shotgun blast, which unfortunately we see all of these quite often. And you can see that you're going to manage each one of these a little bit differently, but the same principles will apply to each of them. So the role of external fixation, and one of the things that Paragon's done a great job over the last year or so is launching a larger external fixation system, whether it's a delta frame or bar to clamp system, or the ring fixators, and soon to come will be the mini external fixators as well. And this is one of the things that I think is probably very poorly understood, or at least not often enough utilized in the foot, is external fixation. I'd implore all of you to get on the AO Trauma website. Michael Storch does an excellent lecture on external fixation in foot trauma specifically. But we're trying to accomplish several things when you utilize this. We're trying to temporize the soft tissues. That allows the tissues to cool down, to get them through that, in, that immediate or uh, acute inflammatory phase, but also what it allows you to do is to watch with soft tissues to see how they're going to respond. So as that crush injury that we saw, you're not going to really understand the full extent of that injury for a week or maybe even weeks down the road versus somebody has a huge open fracture that's a little bit easier to understand. But if we can temporize the tissues, get things out to length, we improve the lymphatic outflow and we let the soft tissues cool down. Restoring length is also helpful in understanding the fracture. You can see this in pilon fractures. You can even see it in smaller fractures in the foot or just a basic trimalleolar fracture or some comminution. If you use external fixation, you can get things out to length. Then you can go ahead and get your advanced imaging, such as a CT scan, and get a much, much better understanding of the fracture personality or architecture that you're dealing with and be able to plan appropriately. So the guiding principles for midfoot and forefoot trauma all center around the metatarsal weight-bearing parabola, right? Things have a certain length pattern they're supposed to adhere to, and all the metatarsals are supposed to sit evenly on the ground. If we haven't accomplished these things, then we haven't accomplished an anatomic reduction. And also talking about medial column, whether you're doing reconstructive surgery and doing fusions, whether you have like a multi-joint involved medial column fracture, you have to also establish a normal sagittal plane alignment and get the dorsal cortices of that first and second metatarsal normal and reestablish a normal Mary's angle or as close to it as that foot will allow you. We all understand the keystone arch concept, but the reason why I put this in here and specifically showing the CT scan, so a lot of midfoot trauma is going to involve transcuneiform screws. And if you don't understand that that intermediate cuneiform sits above the other two, but also is triangular in shape, it's very easy to shoot low on your transcaneiform screws and not only miss the bone and, get, and miss the stability that you're shooting for, but run a very good chance of skewering the neurovascular bundle, which sits right at the apex of the intermediate caneiform. Fusion principles, midfoot trauma is going to talk a lot about primary fusions. These are exactly the same thing as an RAF. We want to make sure that intraoperatively we get a true lateral view so we can understand and we've established Mary's angle. We have normal sagittal plane alignment with respect to the dorsal cortices of the first and second metatarsals, but also getting a true AP view to make sure we establish that normal length parabola. We all know if that first tarsal metatarsal joint is aligned in either a plantar flex or dorsal flex position, it can look either abnormally short or long. So you want to make sure you're getting multi-planar simulated weight bearing views. Troy Buffelli does an excellent job at writing up some principles with this. And then most Paragon trays are going to have this purple little tray top you see here, which literally has a huge foot on it. And this is meant specifically to take weight bearing films. You can also see in the bottom right here how you have a nice clean border of that foot plate showing you you're getting a true lateral. So let's talk about the list frank joint complex. Mark Meyerson really popularized this idea of dividing the midfoot into three columns. And I think it's really important in understanding that the medial and the lateral columns, as we all know, have independent ranges of motion. But it's that locked in central um, column that can be really problematic. The fact that there's very little motion in these joints is why you can see such devastating comminution in these specific tarsal metatarsal joints as opposed to the other ones that have an independent range of motion. But also, you have to understand that you have to get the transverse plane alignment normally as well, or we're not going to restore that, that keystone concept of the arch. But if you divide the foot into this, then you can plan appropriately not only your incisions, but also your fixation approach and sequence of reduction. So as we all know, list frank injuries are a spectrum. You can see something on the left here. This is very subtle. 
there is specifically and very purposely both AP views are on the same x-ray. This is so you can see these subtle differences. And this is one of those things like, you know, something just doesn't feel right here. You get a spider sense tingling. And there's a concept called the candle flame sign which is just viewing this as a candle flame. And you can see this candle flame exactly right through this area. Whenever you see this, even if the border of that second tarsal metatarsal joints lined up appropriately, you need to have a plan to stress this appropriately to make sure that you're not gonna overlook an unstable injury. As we move on, you can start to see a little bit more of an obvious injury. You're starting to see some comminution in the lateral aspect of this first. If you look very carefully, you can actually see a basal or fracture in the first metatarsal. And you start to get this sense that this maybe has a little bit of a shift into it. Now you're starting to see the more obvious homolateral injuries all the way up to what I like to just call a scrambled midfoot, which this is extremely obvious. Things are not right here. The one caveat that I would impart before we leave this slide is even in a situation like this, where the first tarsal metatarsal joint looks normal, or you don't see the malalignment like this, but the second has shifted, in my personal opinion, you were obligated to prove that the first tarsal metatarsal joint is stable. And that's going to be an intraoperative maneuver and just have plans in place to fixate that as part of your construct. I think it's worthy to mention Charcot here. I've been involved with a couple of medical legal cases where patients unfortunately ended up with below knee amputations. If you see a mismatch between the mechanism of injury and the severity of the injury you're seeing on x-ray, you really need to question what's going on here. Even if the patient doesn't have an obvious you know, neuropathy or obvious diagnoses that could lead to neuropathy, I think the onus is upon us to make sure that's not there. And even in the emergent setting, if you can't prove this, no one's going to fault you for assuming this is an acute Charcot event. And especially if it's accompanied with the stigmata of Charcot, the redness, warmth, and swelling, regardless of whether or not there's an open wound, something just doesn't check out on the SNP test here and you need to investigate further. So what are our goals of surgical treatment? It's basic AO, it's respecting and preserving the soft tissues, it's achieving an anatomic reduction, getting a stable fixation construct, and the goal is all leading to one thing, which is to try to restore function to as close as the pre-trauma function as we can. And I think this is where experience comes in and really being able to temper patients' expectations and letting them know what injuries are they likely to get back to the pre-injury level of function or which ones are just not very realistic. When I talk about Liz Frank injuries, I tell patients like, look, your foot's never going to be the same. It will be some semblance of what it was before. And especially if we're doing primary fusions, you can say, we will get things lined up better than they were. You're gonna have hardware in there that may be a problem. Usually not if you choose wisely, which is the difference between that and an ORIF, but also let them know they're gonna have a constant feeling of stiffness around their midfoot. I basically will grab patient's foot and just, squeeze it and say, you're going to feel like I'm walking around holding your foot like this for the next six months. These patients swell, they have paresthesias or even anesthesia as part of that swelling, and they usually always feel like they can't move their toes. And these are all things that will work themselves out in time at the appropriate rehab. So to fix or diffuse, thanks to Chris Kutsia, this has become an age-old argument. Talk about probably one of the most mis misquoted papers in foot and ankle. This is definitely one of them. The whole intent of that paper was not to say that Liz Frank injuries should be primarily fused. These were high energy, purely ligamentous injuries that he was speaking of. But as in all things, it's been shifted and it's been to wear many different hats. But if we get down to it, when do I personally do an RIF? If it's a low energy injury, you know, patient has a simple slip down the stairs. Uh, there may be fractures present, but there's very minimal or no comminution of, as part of this or patients have a very high level of activity and you don't see comminuted intraarticular fractures. This is where you start getting into the more subtle Liz Frank type of injuries. Bob Anderson does a great job at really talking about this and understanding what patients require a certain level of diligence, taking them to the OR, stressing them. And also Steve Rakin really talked about this with his MRI study and showed, look, if these patients have edema in their Liz Frank ligament, or the metatarsal one and cuneiform two ligament, these patients need to go to the operating room if there's edema there or if it's ruptured because there's a very high positive predictive value, they will be unstable and require fixation. What about fusion? High energy injuries. 
Why? It's usually going to have greater comminution. It's going to have greater disruption to the soft tissue envelope. Obese, elderly, low demand patients, where you have to really wonder sometimes if the juice is worth the squeeze on these folks, and you get one chance. And these patients are going to have a difficult time being non weight bearing. They may have comorbidities that don't make them excellent surgical candidates for multiple surgical assaults. So you need to make it count. Neuropathic patients, it's kind of like for us, if one is good, three is better for them. So you're going to be looking towards super constructs. You want long-term stability because if the initial trauma didn't kick off a shark co-event, your surgery may. And lastly, just patients in general that you may think are not going to come back. Trauma patients have a tendency to disappear in our neck of the woods. Uh, some of them disappear into the penal system. Some of them, who knows where they go. But we may not see them back, so you want to make it count if you're going to do something on these folks. Operative strategies for incisions, it completely depends on what I need to do. I think the caveats are this. If you know that you have to address all three columns of the foot, you're better to treat your first ray incision more medial. I mark out my incision for the second and third rays on fluoro, and I line up to just about the medial, if not the lateral border of the third tarsal metatarsal joint, you will still be able to hit two and three. Because remember the keystone concept of the arch, three slopes down dramatically. And we'll talk about that when we're talking about putting the plates on as well. And then if four and five are involved, I'll usually center my incision over the medial aspect of the fifth. They talk about having a four centimeter skin bridge on the dorsum of the foot. That can be a little bit hard to achieve, but it's been shown if you get at least about two and a half centimeters and you're creating careful full thickness flaps without undermining, you should probably be okay. So this is a great segue to talk about getting through the soft tissues and now we need to put it all together. I think Paragon 20 has done an absolutely fantastic job in being very mindful and very specific in indications and the unique anatomy of the foot and their plating. This comes out of the gorilla set. This is basically their Liz Frank or tarsal metatarsal plating system. You can see a whole array of things going from top to bottom. You have single ray plates. You have combined first and second, and the third row, second and third. And then you can get longer kind of recon plates or plates that are have to span multiple fractures, either in single ray or dual ray plates. And one thing that's really important about these is not only the fact that you have a lot of versatility, the plates are significantly thin and clocking in about 1.4 millimeters, but they can accept two, seven, three, five, or four, two screws. I'm a very big fan of the four, two screw. It's got a different core diameter and thread uh, diameter and pitch to it. So it's really gonna be an excellent screw to get compression through their slotted holes. Also bearing in mind that these cuneiform portions of these plates are going to be either locking or non-locking. I prefer to lock them. The cortex and the cuneiform is very thin, and it allows me to have a good stable fixation. It brings two to three, two and three together is one unit, which I really like. These are angled to take into consideration the arch concept, but they're also angled to respect the metatarsal declination angle. A lot of times I will have the baby gorilla plating system available as well. This allows me to deal with smaller comminuted fractures, either in the metatarsals that I'm fixing or away from this area. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. And also having your whole complement of non-plate screws available. So I usually will have the 2025s, I'll have the 3Os, and I'll have the 4Os available. And these allow me to capture fixation outside the plate, of course. And these can either be lagged by design or lagged by technique. So in talking about metatarsal fractures, same thing. You have to consider the anatomy, just like you're looking at a tibia. Is this a diaphyseal fracture? Is this a metaphyseal fracture? Is it articular, non-articular? Is it combined? What are you dealing with here? Because that's going to inform how you're going to fixate it. We know that if you can achieve it, articular blocks should have compression. We know that comminuted cortical or diaphyseal type of fractures can be spanned and get healing by secondary tension versus having to get a little bit more robust fixation in the metaphysis. At the same time, we have to be ready to deal with length deficits or loss of bony contour, such as comminuted fractures and have biologics available for us. So this is the baby gorilla plate offering. They have about everything you could possibly want. And if they don't have it, I can make one of these be what I want it to be. Um, I always have plate cutters available because I oftentimes will just customize my plates. 
Um, these longer uh, locking plates are fantastic, but if you want a straight plate that also has a compression hole in it, you have that option as well. And if you need, you want something that's compression hole, but you want longer fixation or longer working length, you can stack plates as well. These are thin enough that you can do that. And the mesh plate is excellent for a blowing out midfoot just to kind of hold all those cancellous bones together. And no metatarsal fracture lecture be complete without at least mentioning fifth metatarsal fractures for a moment. They've done an excellent job in their Jones fracture offering. This is a cannulated drill technique, but you can put in a solid screw if you would like, and the literature usually leans in that direction. You can see you've got a good span of diameters from 4.0 to 6.2. They have this curved guy wire, uh, a tissue guide, which I personally really like. I think especially if you're teaching, it really helps the residents kind of get that high and inside location for your starting point. And also they have the option of having a night doll or just a solid stainless steel guide wire. I personally like the solid one and I just put it on under oscillation and I can usually nail it the first time around. The fifth metatarsal plates as we get more proximal dealing with the zone one, two and three fractures. They have this kind of nice curvature plate, which is the top one that matches the contour of the fifth metatarsal extremely well. Zone one plates, they have a hook plate that you can put in a separate lag screw if you want. Or if you want to have a hook plate for a Jones fracture, they have longer ones that fit that contour quite nicely. So biologic augmentation. Um, I have multiple sizes of this V92 FC Plus uh, in our fridge. It's a pretty unique graft. It has, excuse me, a proprietary carrier with these cortical fibers. It has demineralized bone matrix as part of this carrier. And it also has cells that have the ability to go into the osteoblast lineage with an extremely high number of about 1.5 million cells per cc. And this is something that thaws out very quickly. And it, you can have a four hour working window once it's thawed out. It's extremely easy to handle so you can pack it. You can irrigate over it and it won't wash and weigh. But what it doesn't have is it doesn't have DMSO. And that's important because that can be toxic to cells. We I mean, you know some of those other graphs out there that have Privileged and non-privileged cells, so osteoblastic cells, have a DMSO carrier that needs to be addressed. I use these in these situations to augment primary fusions. I do a lot of stress relief grafts with defects, either from a comminuted fracture or length defects. Especially if you know you have a solid construct, you can put that in the tarsal metatarsal joints. And also dealing with non-unions, we use it quite a bit as well. And now what everyone's been waiting for is actually some cases. So this patient here had a moderate energy injury. You can see that the second tarsal metatarsal is off. On the AP, you can see it's off in the sagittal plane on the oblique view, and you kind of start to get the sense there might be something going on further over here. And so in the CT scan, and hopefully that comes through well, you can see the tar second tarsal metatarsal shifted. You can see there's a fracture in that fourth metatarsal right there where you basically split the fourth into basically a T. When we went ahead and fixated this, this is a pretty typical construct for me. When, and I'm doing primary fusions, I like a 4-0 home run screw. The goal is to always try to get this midline in the first tarsal metatarsal joint and right in the pocket of this cuneiform right here. If you have an adult patient, it's normal size and your home run screw is shorter than 36, you're not throwing it correctly. That's just my personal opinion on that. With medial neutralization plates, they have a whole offering of first TMT plates. What I personally found works the best in most people, unless you have to have an interpositional graft, is this is actually their Evans or their Heavens plate. And I take the contralateral plate and I flip it upside down. What this allows me to do is you get this perfect contour of the medial cuneiform. It lets this dorsal proximal screw sit perfectly so you get transcaneiform trans fixation and it'll span this area quite nicely. It's nice and beveled here as well, originally for the perineal tendons, but it's beveled very well for the TA tendon as well. So I utilize this a lot. I'm a very huge fan of this combi plate right here. I think locking two and three together as one unit is essential. The way I'll typically do this in a fusion is I'll, lock, I'll put in the locking screws in the cuneiforms. I'll eccentrically drill in this oblong hole to get compression, and then I will lock it in with the locking screw here. A lot of times if the patient can take it, I will use a 4-2, but if you don't want to do that right out of the bat, you can start at the 3-5. If you don't get a good bite, you can go up to a 4-2. And then you can see we use little mini frag or like little 2-0 screws here for this. 
I'm a really big fan of locking in four and five as a unit with this pin that goes from basically the fifth met into the cuboid. Sometimes I'll involve the fourth as well, but not always. And this is showing the patient a year out and they're healed nicely. This is another patient, a little bit higher energy injury. You can see a little bit more of a scrambled mess in the midfoot here. Seconds, obvious shifting over. My spidey sense says I shouldn't be seeing this facet of the medial cuneiform here. And I can't tell if I have a splint or a cortical step off. So of course this patient is all patients should get advanced imaging. This is her sagittal plane imaging here. You see a combination of the medial cuneiform, seconds off, thirds has a fracture. Fourth had a little fracture and fifth is off as well. And you can see here on the AP view is further confirmation. So with this patient, you're going to start to see I'm kind of a one trick pony on some of these. Same idea. Small neutralization plate, home run screw. I wanted to try to span that third metatarsal, metaphyseal diaphyseal fracture. So this is where I use this longer plate. You are not obligated to use this hole. A hole is an opportunity, not an obligation, but we did lock in each of the cuneiforms. We were able to get compression across this fracture. And this patient went on to heal nicely as well. At the same time, actually had a combined ankle fracture that we fixed simultaneously. So here's another one. This is actually low energy. This patient tripped over the hose getting gas, but she had a very huge axial load. And this is what's called a Lisfranc variant. You can see where the medial cuneiform just kind of slid off the navicular right here and even took a little piece of the navicular with it. The challenge with these, and sometimes I debate with this, and, and I, in hindsight, maybe would have done this one a little bit differently. I may have would have spanned the navicular cuneiform joint, but intraoperatively, I didn't think that I needed to. And so um, we saw these fractures here, but we'll run through these CT scans since we have them. So you can see the full personality of the fractures. And this is subtle. You look at her and think her Liz Frank joint doesn't look that bad, but we know that cuneiform is unstable, right? So if it's shifted at the navicular, it's either likely unstable at the first as well. And she's actually unstable in two and three intraoperatively. And so this is what we did. We did the combined one, two tarsal metatarsal plate. This allowed us to lock that medial cuneiform in here. I wanted to get a little extra fixation closer to the navicular cuneiform joint. So I came across the two five with the washer and just another little small uh, two O with a washer for that navicular. Now this patient did not want a fusion. This patient wanted to have an RIF. And we, the one thing you will see is if you really read the literature, at about a year out, it's pretty much a wash, whether or not patients, they do about the same, whether they have a fusion or an RIF. There used to be a big debate that putting transarticular screws predisposed people to arthritis. There's been several randomized controlled trials now that show that's actually not true. Um, patients functionally do pretty much the same whether you bridge plate these patients or do transarticular fixation. But the one thing that does make the difference is getting anatomic reduction. So this patient's hardware did eventually need to come out. Here's a dirt bike accident. You're seeing a theme here. We have the highest number of ATV and dirt bike related trauma than any other hospital in the entire country, according to our trauma database. So we see a lot of this and it's about trauma season right now. So here's a patient fracture, scrambled fifth metatarsal. You can get the sense that things are really kind of falling apart on this guy. And we can see on his CT scan here, I put this in more so you can kind of get a flavor for how many pieces his fifth metatarsal is in. So this guy's pretty banged up. So acute trauma is going to have hematoma. And I put this in here just to make a point that sometimes the trauma and the hematoma would do your dissection for you. Bear in mind where the neurovascular bundle should be and be very careful as you go through here. And the one on the right is just showing how nicely this plate fits. So you can see how it looks like this plate sitting on a, a little bit more of the lateral aspect of the second met. But if you take an oblique x-ray intraoperatively, this thing's sitting pretty midline and it's right midline on the third. And you just want to be mindful of that before you commit, you plate tack this in and just get an oblique view of the foot to make sure you have it lined up where you want. And this is showing him here, my typical construct. We stacked a baby gorilla plate here to deal with that second metatarsal. Use another baby gorilla plate that I basically made my B and made to put this fracture the way that I wanted it to, and then locked it in place here, four and five, with the same pin that we typically do. And this is him a year out. 
So this last one I demonstrated not so much for the Liz Frank part of it, but more um, to not let you forget about the nutcracker fracture on the cuboid. You can see in this top picture, once we've used the distractor to get four and five away, how impacted this is. You can see all the little pieces of articular cartilage here. And this cuboid was just smashed to heck. And so the one thing you also have in the baby gorilla offering is these specialty trauma plates. They have cuboid plates, navicular plates, and medial and lateral tailor plates, which really fit extremely well and came in very handy on this case. And this is a case that once you get your articular surface out where you want it, you can let the distraction down very lightly just to use the fourth and fifth articular surfaces as a template for reduction, just like you would the talus for a calcaneal fracture, but then using bone graft to pack that metaphyseal bone that was crushed. This is another great opportunity for the V92. This is showing the patient a year out. So metatarsal fractures, uh, this is, we see a lot of these patients who are treated non-operatively for these zone three fractures. Uh, patients that have cabus foot types are very prone to have non-unions in these proximal fifth met fractures. And this is just showing the use of a baby gorilla plate allowing us to get compression through this area and then packing this with V92. Just showing another, this is a patient that had a typical dancer's fracture. These come in a few different shapes and sizes. A lot of times they'll have that small little butterfly fragment. I used to watch my attending struggle because they would try to detach that from the periosteum then try to decide what to do with it. The answer is don't detach it from the periosteum. Just trap it with your plate. If you have it a long oblique fracture, you can get a lag screw that can come across and just treat it just like a fibula. And then sometimes these are extremely comminuted, just like you can see dual plating on fibulas or in other areas, you can dual plate metatarsals with these baby gorilla plates as well as you can see here. This is another patient. This was a patient with a non-union, had a uh, plantar flexed first race. We did a DFWO utilizing these 12 jaw staples in an orthogonal fashion, worked fantastic for this osteotomy. I think this is that long fifth metatarsal plate oblong hole option if you want to use it, but you're not obligated to. The hook plates, um, personally, I don't use these quite as often, um, but they definitely have their place. You can use them with or without a separate lag screws you can see here, and they do work pretty well. The instrumentation is pretty nice to impact it. Just want to make sure that your tines or your arms are actually engaged in here and not just sticking in the perineal brevis. And ignore the pet, the metaductus, but this is just showing the creativity that you can have. This patient fell through their floor. And so a very high risk patient, but you can see basically customizing these baby gorilla plates to do what we want, had a Liz Frank ligament injury at the same time, and also had a shearing fracture off here. So we used a headless screw, almost like as an intermedullary nail, and just to let these threads engage that sub, the subchondral bone. And surprisingly, it did not die. I thought for sure that it would. Here's a high energy dirt bike injury, open fracture. You saw his uh, picture earlier. You can see the metatarsals out here in left field. You can see the multiple comminuted pieces. This patient was seen in an outside emergency department, was irrigated at bedside and closed. Uh, definitely not proper treatment of this. And we can opine on that in the questions if you want. And, and then his parents uh, came the next morning to our walk-in clinic and then came to see me. So this is basically showing the comminution in his first metatarsal. Mind you, this kid's 16 years old. And so if this was an adult patient, you very well may consider doing a primary fusion on this patient if you can get it together. But at 16 years old, uh, we wanted to save that for plan B, and we were going to give him a shot. And so you can see how this proximal phalanx was basically almost just like a pilon fracture or like the lateral process of the talus. It just went right into that met and just split it like a log. And this is what we did. This is showing intraoperatively, again, utilizing self-retaining distractors, or you can use a mini rel external fixator, getting that fracture out to length, disimpacting those pieces. Um, this always looks like a scene from Hellraiser. Uh, I always help tell them to pull out every small 1.1 pin they have, and I will go through most of them in these RIFs. And this is just showing dual plating again, allowing us to deal with that comminuted fracture, making a construct that's not too rigid, but something that's also going to allow us to maintain the architecture that we want. So in summary, we want to adhere to accepted principles, whether it's a leg, a foot, a hand, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. And AO has laid these out for us very nicely. I think if we adhere to these principles, our outcomes are going to be more predictable. 
you want to study the fracture from the mechanism of injury, the soft tissues, and understand that fracture personality the best that you can, and you will never be faulted for planning. The more that you plan, the better you're going to do and stick to that plan. But on the other hand, surgery is an art, and we know uh, good plans are just sometimes just turn into mush. And so being agile is definitely a gift, but you cannot be agile if you don't understand the fracture have the experience and understand most importantly what's in your toolbox and that's the one thing that i didn't put on here is i think when you guys get out and practice understanding what tools are available to you is just as important as understanding the injury and knowing the principles because you have to make the tools work and so if you can find a company that you can work with that has a very complete offering has wonderfully trained reps that in my opinion are not reps they're consultants at that point that is going to make you a lot better in the operating room. It'll make your staff more comfortable and that consistency will always pay off. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gentile. That was, yeah, that was awesome. I hadn't seen that presentation before. I love it. Thanks, brother. I had no idea that you were doing that much. I mean, it makes sense where, where you've been the last couple of years, but no idea that you were doing that many kind of motorcycle accident, that, that sort of that level of trauma. So I'll shut up and let the attendees ask <laughs> questions because I know that there's some that are going to come through, but thank you for doing that. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity. Anybody wants to come off of mute, go, go right ahead. Hey, so uh, this is Christina. Um, I had a question about that last case you just presented with the um, first comminuted metatarsal no. fracture. Yep. Um, so were you distracting it and primarily fusing it in one go or did you kind of like because we had a similar case also come in recently uh -huh. actually it was yeah. um gunshot wound through the first metatarsal head yeah. um we uh put in an x-fix um mm -hmm. pretty similar to your distraction positioning but instead of putting it in the first metatarsal we actually put in a media cuneiform sure. so we can scan it Yep. Um, I was just curious, like if you had any fracture blisterings or did you just kind of, by the time that you saw the patient, did it kind of calm down and then you kind of primarily fused it or? Yeah, great questions. So with this case in particular, he showed up uh, the day after his injury mm -hmm. and um, his soft tissue swelling actually looked really good. He didn't have fracture blisters. So I went right through the actual fracture laceration and use that as my exposure. Um, and I didn't actually did not primarily fuse him. We talked about that as an option and that would be something down the road. And so we were actually able to get his articular reduction back together um, mm -hmm. and we'll see how he does. Um, I'm sure he'll probably be arthritic to some component or to some degree, but I'm hoping that youth will allow him to have a better tolerance for that. But I think if you were primarily fusing it and you had a really comminuted fracture like that, if you're really concerned that, geez, you know, I have it put together well, but I'm really kind of worried about whether that's going to stay together, you could absolutely leave the external fixator on, just like we would think if you're doing a TTC fusion with the Nell and you put a frame over it, just that little extra added stability is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Uh, hi, Dr. Gentile. My name's Ali. I'm one of the second year residents. Hi, Ali. Um, Hi. Uh, so I had a question just about your algorithm. I know you mentioned that uh, the recent literature shows that it's kind of a wash, whether you do like a fusion versus an ORF one year out. But what about those instances, say you have an obese individual that has kind of like a benign injury versus someone that's more active, that's more comminuted, high, um, high energy injury? Is it more so the energy of the injury that kind of dictates where you're going with them as far as fusion versus ORF, or is it who they are, what they're trying to do, stuff like that? Uh, yes, <laughs> it, it's it's all of those things. And, and I have a long discussion with these patients. Um, you know, I'll kind of take a look at all those factors that you mentioned. And I will say, look, you know, your options are ORF or fusion. Uh, here's what the literature says. Um, based on your injury and my experience, um, a fusion may be a better option for you. But the one thing to take into consideration is, you know, all the things that come with the fusion. But I counsel people in like kind, if you do an RAF, the likelihood that you're going to have to have another surgery to have that hardware out is high. And so if you have a tolerance for that, um, then we can do the RAF. 
Um, if they're blasted, it was really high energy injury or purely ligamentous. I'm I'm probably going to lead lead the witness a little bit and try to get them to go into the fusion. I think that the tough thing is is the really young active patient. Um, and young is relative, right? So perfect example is I had a family member of mine who is a very competitive soccer and tennis player. And although he's an adult, he's an orthodontist, he's very busy. This is a really bad injury. He had a homolateral injury and he really debated what he should do. And this is the closest that I could have to me. And I said, Joe, I get it fused. And I, and I walked him through the same thing. And he he's unique. He's been able to get back to all his activities, but he's one of those people that you could really vacillate. Um, and so that's why he and I had a lot of conversations about it. And at the end of the day, he made the right choice. I think the hard ones are not so much what to do, but you get these young athletic patients who are really competitive and need to get back to play, can't really afford to have a high likelihood of a second surgery and just say have like an isolated list frank injury. They're unstable but they don't have fractures. It's just a Liz Frank ligament is ruptured. What do you do with those patients, right? The, those are the challenging ones to me. And I think there's a study out of Europe looking at Premier League soccer players. And these patients are actually having flexible fixation and getting back to Premier League play. So it just depends. But I fixated patients with screws and um, I've had to take most of them out because they become symptomatic. Gotcha. Thank you. Of course. Hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, definitely. Cool. And when you say the flexible fixation, you're talking like suture button or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's some companies out there that have these proprietary um, like internal braces for the list Frank. Um, I've had decent luck with them. I've had colleagues who have, I've had people have uh, those anchors pull out and have problems or getting fractures of the second metatarsal or causing a symptomatic stress reaction at that uh, button second metatarsal interface. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Jessica. Hey. <laughs> so, you know, Monique and I, uh, Monique's one of the residents on here. We had that exact case. Was it this week, this week or last week? Um, but he was a college football player, defense, yep. so like 258 pounds, I think. Indeed. Isolated Liz Frank ligament. Basically wants to play now. Um, had the conversations. Fix or fuse you know, it didn't have any concomitant fractures. Um, I said, you know, we can consent you for it all. And I, I plan to ORAF and stress it when I took it out and then put fi flexible fixation in at that time, if it was still unstable, then I decided to do that in stage one, um, do interkineiform uh, screw if he was unstable there, then the flexible fixation is already there. If I go to take out the inner cuneiform, the tightrope stays in and he maybe right. gets back a little bit quicker. Um, I hope that was the right call. Honestly, I, I really debated for a long time on him. Um, you know, everything stressed just fine once we put the tightrope across. And I only really put the one inner cuneiform in because everything else was so stable. But he's a big guy and he's going to be hard on it. And, you know, it's tough, tough calls on these ones. You know, it, it is. And I don't think anyone really knows the answer. You know, I could I could cite that Premier League paper to make my point. But I can also tell you that these are career enders for some folks. You know, there are a lot of NFL players who have never been able to make it back. And so that's my opening to them. Like, look, you have a you have a potentially, you know, career ending injury. We're going to do our best to try to get you back to play. And I think I think the, the thing that you can do wrong is give people realistic, unrealistic expectations. I think as long as you educate them, the pros and cons of each of those choices, um, I think you're, do, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And there's a doc who is um, down at UT Galveston, and he fixes it. When he does, like I said, this Frank ligament injuries, he's fixating these with like 50 screws. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, because he's had a lot of problems with this flexible fixation. Um, but I've also seen two of his patients that came back to Portland that had second metatarsal fractures. So, yeah. Yeah, we shall Pros and see. cons of everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Any other questions? 
great. I bored you guys that much. And it's 10 o'clock for me here. And I'm more spry than all of you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Gentile. And yeah, thanks to every, everybody who jumped on here. Um, really excited for you and the move and uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Gentile. Cheers. See you soon, Jess. Thanks.